This is Join Us in France, episode 311. Bonjour, I'm Annie Sargent, and today I'm excited to announce my cookbook. Join us at the table, everyday French recipes anyone can make at home. These are classic French foods that you can make Even if you didn't go to cooking school, even if you're busy, even if some members of your family eat gluten-free or vegetarian. French food has long been categorized as difficult to make. But is it really? For the most part, it's not. I don't think so, anyway. Regular French people like me make our classic dishes at home all the time. And, you know, when you see French chefs on TV, they have an image to maintain. They go all out with the theatrics. And I understand, you know, TV has to be entertaining. But what happens in your average French home? Well, that's what my book is about, <laughs> because I'm just a French mama cooking at home, and I don't have all day, you know, or beautiful props or whatever. I just do it the way everybody does in France. If you've been listening to this podcast, well, you know that I like to keep it real about what living in France is like. And we do not slave in the kitchen all day, every day. <laughs> and we still eat pretty well. There are more and more French families where the kids decide to go vegetarian or vegan. There are more and more French people of all ages who decide to go gluten-free. Does that mean we stop eating blanquette or onion soup? No, we make adjustments. Sometimes it doesn't take that much. In my cookbook, I share the classic recipe, the one with the meat and the flour and the cheese and the butter, you know. But then I tell you how to adapt it for different dietary requirements and also, in many cases, how to make it a little bit lighter than the original. For me, it's about sharing the inspiration to eat better at home, to nudge you to include some wonderful French dishes in your normal meal lineup. And I would love it if I made you feel a little bit better about our inability to travel and to eat at restaurants right now. You can bring the French experience into your home with this cookbook. You can make it your way and travel back to France in an instant through food. And there are also a few things that went wrong when preparing the book for publishing, and I'll tell you a little bit about that too. Thank you, patrons, for giving me a precious gift, the time to produce this podcast. Your monthly gift makes it all possible, and in these times of pandemic and craziness, I can't tell you how much it means to me. Show notes for this episode are on joinusinfrance.com forward slash 311, the numeral, and that's where you can see a recap of what we've discussed and where you can also buy Join Us at the Table. Follow Addicted to France on Instagram to see the photos of the foods featured in the cookbook. I'll post them going forward uh, a little bit every day. The best way to stay in touch with me and with the podcast is to sign up for my newsletter at joinusinfrance.com forward slash newsletter. Open Join Us at the Table, you see the gorgeous book cover. And I must say thank you to my friend Brenda, who was on episode 124, for pointing me towards that provider and that cover. When I first saw it, it really spoke to me. And even though I went looking for other covers, I kept coming back to that one because it, it's just right. Brenda is an author herself, and she has been pushing me to write a book for years. Thank you so much, my friend. I must also thank the folks in the secret Facebook group who saw all the covers I was considering, voted on their favorite and told me why. I took all of that into consideration and I made changes based on their comments. 
I decided to call the book Join Us at the Table as a tie-in to the name of this podcast and also because that's exactly what I'd like all of you to do. Join us around a French table, at least in spirit. The subtitle is Easy French Recipes Anyone Can Make at Home, and I chose that because that's really the book I wanted to write. Classic French and yet easy enough for the average person to make at home. And when I look at podcast stats, I can see that I have listeners all over the world. Uh, uh, 95% of you are in the US, but then uh, there's Australia, Canada, France. There's a surprising number of people who listen to the podcast who live in France. India, that's a growing market. I mean, lots of Indians have started to listen to the podcast recently. The UK, Ireland, Germany, Singapore, and even South Africa. But of course... There's even listed tiny islands that I've not heard of where I have a listener. It's like, cool. (laughs) That's why uh, in Join Us at the Table, I included both imperial and metric measurements. Very few cookbooks do that. And by the way, I know why now. (laughs) It's a pain. I had to measure everything different ways and keep track carefully and then check my math and recheck my math. Uh, I also had to round things up or down, you know, uh, in ways that made sense. Um, Thankfully, for a lot of these recipes, you know, it's like how much spice you use is a seasoning. It's up to you. I mean, I give you a baseline, but you can decide to do something different for you. Uh, But there's one recipe where I said, use one cup of noodles and two testers told me that was one person said it was too much. And the other person said it was too little. And so I realized, yeah, it depends on the shape of noodles that you use. Right. And so for that one, I changed it to a weight measurement because that will work every time. So sometimes cups are best, sometimes weight is best. It's just a mess. Anyway, (laughs) the other reason I have metric measurements in Join Us at the Table is that I hope you'll bring this cookbook to France when you visit. And if you rent an apartment uh, in France, you won't find cup and teaspoon measurements in the apartment. The kitchen in your rental apartment may have a kitchen scale and possibly a graduated uh, cup with millimeters and centiliters, but it won't have the cups and tablespoons and stuff that you're used to. And speaking of having different measuring standards in different countries, you know what else is different? Book publishing standards. Yes. Join Us at the Table is now available as an ebook on Kindle. In the next few days, I'll make more versions available through Apple Books, Kobo, Google Play, and I'll start working on the print version as well. Who knows how much extra work will be required? I don't know. I've never done, done this before. And I'm also going to have to figure out how to distribute the book to countries where uh, Amazon doesn't work. And there are a few like that. So, but here's something I really want to make sure you understand. And it's possible many of you already know this, but bear with me for a second. When you buy a Kindle book, that doesn't mean that you can only read it on a Kindle device. As a matter of fact, Uh, Join Us at the Table looks better if you read it on a tablet because then it'll be in full color and you'll be able to click on the links because sometimes I recommend uh, products that work well to do certain things and uh, yeah, you can just see them. And you can also open ebooks on your smartphone. There are free Kindle apps that you can install on any of your tablets or smartphones. And once you buy the Kindle book once, you can open it on several devices, your Kindle device, your tablet, your phone. You can even have a Kindle device on your computer, on your Windows computer, and then it'll open however big your, you know, your screen is on your computer. So the only thing you can't do from any of these devices is print the book. (laughs) So for that, you're going to have to wait for the print version. And I'll start working on that in a few days. Back to the book content. After the cover, you get to the table of contents. I chose to keep French names for all of these recipes. Not because I'm a snuck-up snob. (laughs) 
<laughs> but because French is my first language and also because I know many of the book buyers will also be Francophiles and podcast listeners. They know these recipes by their French names. And when you're in France, that's what they're called. So you might as well get used to seeing them in French as well. And it's good practice for your French. Don't worry. The rest of the book is in English. The other thing that I have never seen done before is that I list the variation on given recipes. There are lots of books that are just for vegans or just for vegetarian. This one is for a little bit of has a little bit of everything. I know from experience that there can be uh, people following different diets in the same household. Many of the recipes I share in this book can be made gluten-free or vegan or vegetarian just by making a few changes. And so I point those out as variations on a theme. So underneath the normal uh, table of contents, you'll find a table with all the variations. And so if you're looking for a classic French dish that can be made gluten-free or vegan, you can go straight to it. And then there's the introduction where I tell you more about me, about my mother, about my influences when it comes to food. I also talk about French children and food. Uh, that's something that's of interest to a lot of people, and there's been whole books written about it. I talk about terroir and why that matters. And uh, I end with more practical considerations, like a tip on how to protect your hands when you're chopping vegetables. Some thank yous, of course, and then we get into the recipes. This is not a long cookbook. I didn't want to deluge you with recipes that you'll never try. The print version will be around 150 pages, which is pretty small for a cookbook. I wanted to give you just a few wonderful recipes that you can try within a few weeks. There are 28 uh, recipes in this final cut. The book starts with three salad recipes. I picked my three favorites. <laughs> Salade de chèvre chaud. So that's the, uh, you've, I'm sure you've had it at restaurants. It's a classic. It's, uh, it's uh, a salad with bread and melted goat cheese on top. It's wonderful. And you can totally make it at home. It's really pretty easy. The next is a classic French vinaigrette. Have you noticed that uh, in France... The salad dressing aisle at the supermarket is very small compared to what you have in the U.S. That's because we make our own salad dressings at home and I share my favorite there. Then we go on to salad niçoise. Ah, oh, that one. It's marvelous. And it's one that uh, people like to argue about what goes in it and what doesn't go in it. <laughs> And I definitely have my opinion about that. And it's uh, in uh, Join Us at the Table. Then we move on to fish. I start with moule à la Normande. So, you know, the wonderful mussels you might have had with the creamy sauce from Normandy. That's the recipe I picked. It's so easy to make, honestly. Why wouldn't you? Uh, then we go all the way across France to Nice in Provence with uh, pizza à la dière, which is a sort of pizza with lots of onion and anchovy. But it's good also without the anchovies so for vegetarians. It's easy to make. It's not something you've had a million times. I think it's wonderful. Then I move on to appetizers and I include a discussion about escargot de Bourgogne and one of my favorites for appetizer is pain à la tomate. I bet you've never had this, but this is a classic Mediterranean dish. It's so good, so easy to make, uh, it, and it looks really good. You can bring it to a party or when you want to have a special appetizer at home. Uh, it's it's fantastic. It tastes so good too. Then the bulk of the cookbook is French regional specialties. Like I said, I do not shy away from classic French dishes because they are delicious and they are not that hard to make at home. Now, I'm going to tell you what they are. They might not be in the same order in the book, but that doesn't matter because you'll find them easily. Uh, <laughs> Join us at the table includes a recipe of cassoulet. Cassoulet. I was born and raised in Toulouse. So I had to go there, right? <laughs> the version I give you preserves all the flavors of this wonderful dish, but it's a lot lighter in calories than the restaurant version because the restaurant version, mm, it's good, but it will kill you. Blanquette. Blanquette is one of my favorites uh, also. On TV, this is one that TV chefs like to do because it 
tastes good and looks good. It smells good. It's that. But when they make it, you'd think it's voodoo. It's really not. <laughs> it's one of the most adaptable French classics ever. And then we go to Alsace with flamme cuche or tarte flambée. That's one that can be made either meaty or vegetarian. And it's yummy. Uh, then we go all the way across the country to Basque country, poulet basquez, which you can make the classic way with chicken. Or if you make it without chicken, it has a different name. It's called piperade. I think this is the healthiest recipe in the cookbook. My mother-in-law, who cooks uh, a lot of Weight Watchers and counts the points and all that, uh, did it. And she said, oh, yeah, it was really good for, for their diet. So that's great. Ashi Parmentier. Uh, this is the French version of Shepherd's Pie. And it's really good. It's much better than anything you've had at a cafeteria, let me tell you. Uh, this one, I delve into the history quite a lot because it's really interesting. I don't talk about the history about every recipe, so where there's stuff that's interesting and that we know for a fact, I go into it. Otherwise, no. <laughs> Boeuf Bourguignon. This one is so famous that there are restaurants in France that serve nothing but that. Uh, it's so good that some families serve it on Christmas Day. And let me let you in on a little secret. It's not hard to make at home. <laughs> now let's go back to Brittany and Normandy with the Galette Bretonne. Okay, this one, to make the Galette, it takes a little bit of practice. But once you get a feel for it, you can transform your home into a creperie. And you can make Galette night the same way you have a taco night. It's really good, really versatile, and uh, delicious. Pot au feu, this one, is probably one of my personal favorites, but I like food, so I like all of them. <laughs> I love everything about pot au feu. Uh, the, the way the beef is cooked, the vegetables, the soup that you can make with the amazing broth. And you know what? You get the same flavors if you make it vegetarian. I kid you not. I tried it and I was surprised. Another one that I make all the time at, at home is a tarte oblette or Swiss chard pie. It's it, it, I mean, Swiss chard is a wonderful vegetable. It's easy to grow. It's pretty. You can find it at the store too. And it makes a wonderful quiche-like dish that you can serve a big slice of uh, tart and then uh, make a salad or on the side. Or It's just delicious. And you can... It keeps well too in the fridge. So uh, for people who live alone, it's it's a good choice. My daughter still asks for this one all the time. Then back to Provence with soup au pistou. It's the kind of the Provençal chili. <laughs> and it's equally good with or without meat. Honestly, I don't think the pork adds much to it at all. Uh, and it's so good on a winter's night. Croque Monsieur and Croque Madame, easy to make, really delicious. You can turn your kitchen into a Paris bistro with this one. Uh, you make oven fries, and you, if you have kids and teenagers at home, they will love this stuff. Okay, now time for some side dishes. How would you like some gratin dauphinois? Do you know where the Dauphinois is? It's above Provence and all the way east uh, against Italy. This is the French version of potatoes au gratin that you'll find in America. But the French version has no cheese in it. And you know what? It's amazing. You should make enough for two days because nobody ever turned their noses up at those leftovers. And try it without the cheese. It's really good. Soup à l'oignon. Okay, so... This is one where there's a big difference between the onion soup I ate at home growing up in France and what they serve at restaurants. I go into details uh, in uh, Join Us at the Table and I give you both versions. But I like the simple home version better to tell you the truth. You should try it. And back to Provence now with ratatouille. That's another one that I think lots of recipe authors overcomplicate. It's really easy to make. You don't have to slave away in the kitchen for hours to eat well. Just follow my instructions and it'll be delicious. Tion de légumes. This is ratatouille for fancy people. <laughs> it looks really good. It's it's. I mean, ratatouille is like not 
great looking. Tion de Legume is the same dish, essentially, but good looking. It's a bit more work, but it's great for company or for special occasions, like for a side dish, for a nice vegetable for Thanksgiving. You, you know, take the time. It's delicious. And then a cooking basic, how to make bechamel. I give you three options, one with flour, one with cornstarch, which makes it gluten-free, and then one with broth, which makes it vegan. See, it, you can be adaptable. You just need to learn the ropes. <laughs> Gratin au chou-fleur. This is one I make all the time. Uh, you know, chou-fleur is a cauliflower. So it's cauliflower au gratin, I guess. You get your vegetables in with this. And, uh, and, and I even tell you how to not stink up your house with the cauliflower because that's important. Salad juive. This one is in honor of my mother who made this a lot and so do I. It's chock full of vegetables. My version is vegan, but there are lots of variations on this dish that I explain in Join Us at the Table. Uh, it's made all over the Mediterranean and it has different names and all of that. It's a beautiful dish. And then desserts. These are classic French desserts that we make at home. I start with clafoutis because it has all these wonderful fruits and it's easy to make, really easy to make. Uh, crêpe maison, crêpe, you know, your kids love the crêpe when they come to Paris, right? You all tell me this on the podcast. Well, you can make it at home. It's really not that hard. And they will ask for it over and over again. And then you'll get better at it. <laughs> crêpe brûlée. Okay, crème brûlée. That's the one that you've had at restaurants all over France. And it's so easy to make. Now, this one, it's best to make it the day before you serve it because it needs to be cold. But it's, it seriously, it takes, like, it takes, um, what, 10 minutes of your attention? And then the rest of the time is just letting it cook and letting it get cold in the fridge. It's very, very fast. That's why they have it at all the restaurants, because <laughs> it's good, it's beautiful, and it's fast. Tarte tatin. Okay, this is for those of you who want to impress your family for Thanksgiving. It is both beautiful and delicious, and I tell you the story for that one, because it's a beautiful story. And last but not least, the very humble cake that French people make with their kids and their grandkids. It's called Gâteau au yaourt, and it's so easy. It's, it's a yogurt cake, but it's your basic crumbly cake, just delicious. So, see, there's good French food for every occasion in uh, Join Us at the Table. Now, for some funny stuff that caused delays. I did not realize before going through the whole process of publishing a book that uh, creating a Kindle book is technically complicated. Uh, long ago, if you think about it, there were professionals for every step of the way in producing a book. Now, people can do it by themselves, but they run into some problems that are kind of uh, frustrating when you're right in the middle of it. I wrote the cookbook. I wrote Join Us at the Table uh, using a tool called Scrivener, and it was all good and fine until I started to export the Mobi file to send to my Kindle. <sighs> yeah. Sometimes the table of contents showed up, but it wasn't clickable. Sometimes it worked perfectly. Sometimes it disappeared totally. Sometimes one recipe was uh, justified and the next one was not. Sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes there was no space between the title and the text. Anyway, you name it, I saw it all. Well, we saw it all because at that point I couldn't complete I, I don't think I could have completed the, pro the project without my husband. Uh, he had to take over because the stuff was really weird and I, I couldn't make any sense of it myself. So he ended up just dropping Scrivener, exporting to Word. Then he tried a tool called Calibre. Then uh, he settled on Juto in the end, which was a recommendation uh, from Brenda's husband. If you're going to write a book... I do not recommend Scrivener. The writing part is going to be okay, but then the exporting, oof. 
Yes, <laughs> especially not Scrivener for Windows. So I'm sure we'll laugh about it eventually, but it was really stressful. I, yeah. And there are better ways that I now understand, you know, once you've done it, you understand it. And it's, it's the truth with cooking too. Uh, you know, when I said galettes are a little bit tricky to make, yeah, once you've made them, you understand what the difficulties are. And that's where I am with books. And so next time I'll go straight to easier processes, live and learn. Again, I want to thank my patrons for supporting the show and giving back. Patrons get several exclusive rewards for doing so. You can see them at patreon.com forward slash join us, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, join us, no spaces or dashes. Thank you all of you for supporting the show. Some of you have done it for years now. You are wonderful. And a shout out this week to new patrons, Kiong and Kathy Leno. Thank you so much for becoming patrons and making this podcast possible. And thank you, Aaron Brown, for going to the yearly pledge. And I will send you a postcard from France with some Join Us in France stickers uh, very soon if you give me a mailing address. Uh, I have received the stickers. As soon as I have five minutes, I will send you the postcards. And I got some lovely feedback about the podcast. Katie wrote, Hello, Annie. I cannot think of a more positive way to start my week than to listen to your podcast during my half-hour drive to work. Sorry, Katie, this week it was late. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but that's very unusual. I hadn't, been, I hadn't put out an episode late in months, possibly years. So it's, I hope you forgive me. But this week you'll get two because you'll one, one, you get one today and one on Sunday. So back to regular schedule. <laughs> anyway, back, sorry, uh, back to what Katie was saying. Podcasts and websites are how I connect with travel content since I discontinued Facebook, a dumping ground of negativity. Oh, yes. <laughs> My husband and I visited Paris while on a Viking river cruise, Bastille Day 2014. Most places were closed and there were military vehicles everywhere. The fireworks were exciting as seen from the top of the boat, which was docked in the 15th arrondissement. We did get to see Notre Dame, the Louvre and Versailles when we returned to, from Normandy. The serenity along the Seine is so beautiful. I very much want to get back to France and explore more of the country, especially since of my, some of my ancestors are French, to feel more French when I get home from work. As a teacher of, young, of uh, teenagers, she pours out a glass of wine and uh, get out the cheese and nibbles. She says, best of luck with your cookbook. Thank you. I am looking forward to ordering it. And yes, you can do that. It's live. Join us at the table on Amazon. And Barbara wrote, Hi, Annie. I have especially enjoyed your podcast as uh, I take my daily walks during the pandemic. It is wonderful to imagine being in all those places you describe in your podcast. I was worried that not being able to travel would depress me, but your positive attitude and common sense approach helped keep me a beat. I just signed up for the newsletter. Thank you. That's uh, joinusinfrance.com forward slash newsletter. Thanks, thanks again for producing such a good podcast. And thank you for writing, Barbara. All right. For my personal update this week, I will keep it brief because all I did this week really is fight with Scrivener. So you don't want to hear all about that. But I listened to Oliver G. of the Earful Tower podcast. He was talking about his experience of the second lockdown and it's totally different from mine. He lives in a small apartment in Paris and I live in a village near Toulouse. It is night and day. Oliver mentions that Parisians are in a bad mood, honking their horns like lunatics, getting angry over small things. And I have no trouble imagining that because I grew up in the, in the Toulouse city center and I do not miss the close proximity of everyone. That's why when I moved home to France, I chose to live in a village. Now, we're not happy that we can't see our daughter. I don't like that I should write myself a permission slip every time I leave my house, even though nobody has ever asked to see it. And half of the time I forget. I don't like when other people wear their mask under their nose. 
But those are really small irritation. It There's a big gap between the pandemic for people like me who live in a house with a little bit of a yard in the countryside. I can walk. Uh, you know, I, I work from home anyway, so that didn't change anything. It's a huge difference between that and people who have to go in to work every day and who live in big cities and all of that. So I, you know, if anything in the countryside, I'm chatting with people more. I've told you that I've gone to two walks a day, most days, because the old dog can't walk as long. So I just do two. <laughs> And a few days ago, somebody I don't know from Adam uh, asked me for English lessons. She knows somehow that I <laughs> speak English and I used to teach English, but I don't at this time. So I told her, oh, I don't do that, but I gave her some tips, whatever. So we ch we'd had a good chat about that. We talked at a distance. We, had, we both had a mask on, but we're not sitting at home being miserable. You know, yesterday, a guy who was running stopped running and uh, when he was approaching me, so I, 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 this happens a lot. People who are afraid of dogs. They they don't want to run past dogs. And so I just said, oh, the dogs won't chase you. He said, oh, no, I'm not worried about the dogs. I was just catching my breath. <laughs> and then we started talking about how he loves dogs. See, uh, my next door neighbor, she jogged past me and then she turned around and said, sorry, I can't stop to talk because I, I want to hurry up and get some bread before the bakery closes. And she says, do you want, do you want me to get you a baguette too? Like, what? <laughs> I've known her for a long time. That's never happened before. Anyway, my point is people are talking to each other more than before the pandemic. And you can see it in real estate prices. In large cities in France, the prices are dropping for the first time in decades. And it's true both in Paris and in Toulouse. It's only a, a percent or two at this point, And it probably isn't going to get any worse than that because the pandemic will come to an end and living in large cities has a lot of wonderful, you know, wonderful things to it. But during a pandemic, it's not fun. Yeah. I, yeah. I get that. Now, Oliver mentions that people are confused about what they can and cannot do. And I totally disagree with him. <laughs> I think people are unwilling to understand what's being asked of them, no matter how clearly it is explained to them. They don't want to hear it. You know, they like, no, mm -mm, not happening. No, I'm not doing that. For instance, a city police officer who lives just a few towns over from me decided to invite friends over, big, you know, big group, 20 people, whatever, uh, for a party at his house. And this was on number, November 1st. And they got drinking and it got loud and several neighbors called the cops. And at night, when you call the cops in France and you live in rural areas, it's the gendarmes that are going to come out, the city police are in bed. So surprise, surprise, the gendarmes will come because they got several calls about this party. So it must have been really rowdy. And they found out that this guy is a cop and that several of the friends that he had invited were also cops. And, you know, don't tell me that they don't know the rules. They know exactly what they're doing. They just don't want to follow the rules. And so they got ticketed. Uh, and uh, yeah, the gendarmes, they see nothing wrong with handing out tickets to city cops. <laughs> so, you know, it's not that they don't know. It's that they don't want to do it. But I am very happy to report that this new lockdown is working in France. 10 days ago, we had 80,000 new infections in one day. It was really scary. And we had several days that were really close to a thousand deaths per day. That's huge for a tiny country like France. But now for seven days in a row, the numbers have been under 20,000 for new infections. It took three weeks to get the numbers improved. So lockdown is announced. For three weeks, the numbers are still horrible. And then they start heading down. And then, of course, they go down and then a bit up and then down and a bit up and down and whatever. And then it's like, but overall, it starts going down after three weeks. This is hard to turn around, you know. The goal for France is to have fewer than 5,000 new infections per day. And they would like to get to that before Christmas. 
because that would ensure that we can have Christmas as families and it won't be scary. You know, uh, some people will get infected, obviously, because whenever you socialize without masks on, you, you're at risk. But the healthcare system won't be overwhelmed and folks who are unfortunate and get the virus will get the best treatment possible. So lockdowns are no fun, but they work. And it's about people deciding to do the right thing. And until then, this virus will keep going. If we all did the right thing for just one month in the whole world, this virus would have nowhere to go and it would die. I know it's not going to happen. <sighs> we're taking the slow road and we're just stretching out. We're making it too easy for this virus to jump from one person to the other. But I am so encouraged by the news of vaccines. Uh, I think most of us, I hope, I hope, uh, that most of us will be able to get vaccinated by this time next year. So November next year, I, I, I hope we'll all be vaccinated. And so then life can go back to normal. Uh, it's getting very real with the vaccines Science, thank you, those companies. I know that there are 11 companies that are getting very close to start uh, uh, the application for general release to, to the public. It's, it's really exciting what's happening with those, uh, with those vaccines. And of course, there will be controversies about the vaccines as well, obviously, because, you know, <laughs> be no fun <laughs> without all the controversies. If you enjoyed the show, introduce a friend to the podcast and show them how to listen. If they love France and good food, they will thank you. And you know what would help me the most? Buy my book. It's called Join Us at the Table. And for now, it's only on Amazon, but I will make it available through more channels very soon. Then pick one recipe from the book, make it at home, and review the book. Those reviews are vital. I get one, I got one already. Thank you so much, Amber. That's That was really cool. Um, if you were one of the recipe testers, you can review the book right now because you've tried one or more of those recipes at home, right? So um, I hope uh, you will enjoy the book as much as I've enjoyed putting it together. Next week on the podcast, I will bring you an episode about trail running and about learning French with Molly Cummings. Send questions or feedback to Annie at joinusinfrance.com. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you join me next time so we can look around France together and cook some French food, would you? Au revoir. The Join Us in France Travel Podcast is written and produced by Annie Sargent and copyright 2020 by Addicted to France. It is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license.